about the region of Latin Indigenous in the Koreas that I saw or Ocean Coast. Yeah. Hi. Thanks. Um, yeah, this is my first Platinum Group Symposium and it's been awesome. Thank you all so much. Um, I was very pleased when I discovered I had a Platinum Group mineral. It's not very big, but um, it is interesting. I hope you'll agree. So um, I'd like to thank my co-authors, especially Park, who's here. Um, and I'd like to thank the Australian Antarctic Division and the Australian Research Council for the funding. So we, we love the highly sidrophile element, not just for economic value, but because they can be used to trace the characteristics and the timing of, of processes that happen, happen in the mantle. And this is because they are compatible in mantle phases, particularly the alloys and the sulfides. So anything that starts to form, um, modify or destroy those phases, th those processes can be recorded. But most of the mantle rocks that we see on the Earth's surface are serpentinized. So they've interacted with water. Serpentinization is interesting because it, it um, creates the very early stages of serpentinization form some of the most reducing conditions that we see on Earth. And it's very reasonable to be curious, um, especially given experimental evidence, about whether these highly sidrophile elements start to be mobilized, whether we start to open the rhenium osmium geochronometer system um, as we serpentinize rocks. Um, people have speculated about this. There's no real clear answer at the moment. And this, this, this is not unexpected. Uh, these elements live in tiny, tiny grains, especially in most ophiolites. Um, and it can be hard to find them. And then when you find them, they can be hard to characterize. Um, fortunately, along with the fantastic TM images that we've seen in this session today, um, we, we also have opportunities to use atom probe tomography uh, to, to characterize tiny minerals. Um, th this is a technique um, that I've applied to some, and I'm going to talk about that today. <coughs> So this is the study area. I was lucky enough to go to Macquarie Island in 2017. Um, it's about halfway between um, Tasmania and Antarctica. It is unique worldwide and a, um, a, a global you know, heritage area because it's a piece of the ocean crust, but it hasn't, and it's subaerially exposed, but it's not an ophiolite. It's just kind of popped up on some transform faults. So we don't see some of the modification that you see that's associated with obduction. It's conveniently tilted so that we have uh, the lower ocean crust towards the north of the island and a load of basalt towards the south and collected some peridotites uh, from the north. And I'm going to talk about a sample from the Boot Hill locality. This is what it looks like. It's pretty pentanized. It's a bit manky looking. You can see it's a Halsbergite. Um, and, and we did a whole bunch of analysis on this. So we cut replicates in sections because I knew we wanted to look for the platinum group minerals. Um, and we did, you know, reflected light petrography. We did the um, team of mineral mapping on those replicates in sections to try and find the platinum group minerals if they were there. Uh, we also did, you know, whole rock geochemistry. We measured the highly citrophile elements. We did, well, when I say we, I mean PARC, uh, did the rhenium and osmium isotopes. Um, and then lots of characterization with scanning electron microscopy, and then used a focused iron beam to lift out and shape some tiny, tiny little needles um, that we analyzed with the atom probe. So this is what the rocks look like. We've got olivine preserved, which is excellent because it's, it's olivine that buffers uh, these serpentinizing systems to the very, very low oxygen fugacities. So seeing that we've still got olivine um, suggests that we might still record some of the characteristics of that time. Then we've got serpentine, we've got magnetite. We do see alloys like our ruite, 
again, giving us confidence that we're looking at those, a rock that's seen those very reducing conditions. Um, that, so early pentandite is altered to the sulfur-poor sulfides like hazelwoodite. And we've got packed bead, copper, cobalt, and nickel enrichment. So things are starting to move around. And spinel is altered to magnetite, and the magnetite's coexisting with the aruite, which is, which is always nice. So we did find platinum group minerals. Um, hide floating meeting controls. There we go. So they, the ones I'm going to talk about are hosted in a kind of manky, altered looking composite grain, um, which is sort of hazelwoodite with pentlandite, cobaltian pentlandite, and magnetite. And they host a laurite inclusion, which is quite nice and idioblastic, um, kind of like your Greek ones, um, and this sort of semicircular copper platinum alloy. These dots are where we took the atom probe needles. Um, and textually, they're ambiguous. Then they're, they're certainly before late serpentinization, but they could be either pre serpentinization or early serpentinization. But fortunately, we have other evidence. What am I doing wrong? Keep slides updated. I don't want that. Excellent. What did I do? What was, well, how did you fix it? This one. This one. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, so this is the grain that you saw in the last slide. Um, this is where we dug a trench to dig out and destroy most of the um, alloy grain. Um, this is the laurite grain waiting to be dug out. This is the needle after it had been shaped. Um, this is a micron. Um, so the, these are seriously tiny. Um, grains and, and e even at, at this scale, you can see it's quite heterogeneous. So this is the results from one of those needles um, from the alloy. Um, this ran really well. So basically with Atom Pro, what you're doing is you mount the needle, you fire a, you, a pulse a laser towards it while it's in an electric with, with a voltage across it. And basically, the laser bashes off the atoms one by one. They go off into a time of flight spectrometer. And by measuring what the atoms are, how long it took to get there, you can actually say what not only what they are, but where they came from. And you can do the 3D reconstruction. Um, and when we got the construct reconstruction for this, it was just like, wow, this is amazing. I hope you think it's amazing, too. So this is the needle. This is 20 nanometers. So these are small features. Um, I'm going to point out these surfaces, which delineate subgrains. Um, they these subgrains are iron and platinum rich. So that's 7% iron and 25% platinum. I want to point out these blue atoms. These are cadmium. So they're outlining a cadmium rich network that kind of splits up. Um, splits up the needle. Uh, Palladium's enriched on these uh, networks as well, and in other places, but I'll show you that later. The other thing I'd like you to notice is this little pink blob. That's uh, OH3, and the char characteristics of that are very consistent with that being a fluid inclusion. That's nice. In a bit more detail, this is platinum, just showing 5% of the platinum atoms. And you can really see that platinum is distributed through the whole needle, um, but is really enriched within those subgrains that I showed with relatively sharp boundaries. And that's sitting with enhanced iron and nickel. This is the cadmium network that I mentioned. And you, see, you can see it's really defining these boundaries. If we look at palladium, you can see it's coexisting with cadmium on the boundaries, but it's also got its own enrichments in the center of these subgrains. So palladium is playing two games. This is the OH3 groups. 
Um, they're basically very little coming from most of the needle, um, but you've got these discs. And if you look at them in more detail, you can see they've got this kind of burst structure. And that's very characteristic of fluid inclusions. So we've got very, very tiny fluid inclusions. And the amazing thing is that with an atom probe, you can actually start to work out what's in them. Um, rhodium also sort of like concentrates on some subgrain boundaries, but different ones to cadmium, which is nice, but it does seem to be co-located with sulfur to some extent. And I'm not going into that story today for reasons of time. So putting that all together, I'm going to turn off the laser pointer, then I'm going to press go on the movie, and we're going to fly through the needle top to bottom. So you can see these subgrains with the iron and platinum. You can see how they're sort of connected in places, not in others. You can see the cadmium network again in 3D, quite well connected. Oh, we missed a fluid inclusion, but another one's going to come up. It's okay. And there it is. So, jolly good. Um, if you want to see it again, you can ask me afterwards. Oh no, we're not going to look at it again. Now, the lorite didn't run so well. Instead of 80 million atoms, we got less than a million atoms, um, which isn't enough to put a reconstruction together. But we did get enough to look at the spectra um, and see that as well as the ruthenium, the iridium and the osmium um, are living with it. So it's, it's not a huge surprise, but it's nice to find them. We didn't find any rhenium in anything, but the bulk, bulk rhenium on these rocks is very low. Okay. So um, the purposes of this work was to think about whether we can remobilize the HSEs by serpentinization. Um, so it's relevant to think about the copper platinum alloy. The heterogeneity, neither the heterogeneity or the textural relationships are diagnostic. You can get both of those in um, mantle hosted alloys that show no evidence of alteration. And we, but we do also know that copper platinum alloys can forming or are interpreted to have formed by some serpentinization, but they tend to be porous. And what we have is not porous. The morphology of norite is also consistent with a high temperature origin, as you saw in the previous talk. So it looks like we have a high temperature characteristics in the alloy grain and the lorite. We also have the OH3 clusters and the cadmium network, which are both consistent with some modification with serpentinization, because obviously OH3 tends to indicate water and cadmium tends to be mobile in fluids. Um, and the phase diagrams are kind of consistent with this. This is a binary phase diagram. Clearly the phase is far from binary, but it gives an, it as an indication of what we might expect. Um, whereas we look at the bulk composition of the whole grain, which is this, this gray bar and, and cool that, then you can see it intersects various opportunities for X solution, depending on what length scale the systems open and closed. Um, and there's certainly opportunities for forming some complexity that might get down to the very platinum and rich subgrains um, at, at lower temperatures. So to conclude, um, we think it's a multi-stage origin for this grain. We see no evidence that the highly citric bar elements more than so that. Um, and that's with some mass balance calculations, which I've removed for reasons of time, but I can show you if you like. Um, but we are seeing mobility on some length scale because otherwise we wouldn't see what we see, um, suggesting that we're decoupling whole rock and grain scale patterns and ratios. And if anybody wants to do something similar, feel free to ask me because because these alloys are producing great results and we're, we're really interested to see what ones from other places look like. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
myself yeah <laughs> uh first well, th thank you it's really interesting technique uh so first question a little bit missed why the first conclusion why was it formed prior to serpentinization because uh yeah so why do i think that why do i think you this yes yeah so i think that because um if it was low temperature the bulk composition of the whole thing uh would be sitting in this kind of space where you've got the mm -hmm. it's not a stable thing at low you'll temperature. have two phases you mean yes at least at yeah. least yeah. um uh, secondly, the morphology of the lorite brain, like low temperature lorite doesn't look like that. Um, and, and thirdly, you know, they're not, they're not porous. They don't look like replacive, but, you know, that, that kind of thing. So I think there's enough that suggests there's a high temperature origin, high temperature origin. Um, yeah, thank you. But I'm, I'm very open to listening to people because you guys have seen a lot more PGMs than I have. So yeah, my mind's open, but I have published it, but that's okay. Of course. <laughs> Thanks for this nice visualization um, by the Atom Probe. My question is regarding the cadmium. Where do you recruit the cadmium from? So I'm thinking that serpentinization is related to seawater. Um, so I, I would say that's probably the most likely source. Okay. Um, nice talk. Um, you mentioned osmium isotopes, but you didn't tell us what the um osmium isotopic compositions of the materials were? No, I didn't. No. So um, we didn't get enough atoms off the lorite to get a composition. Um, I've got a PhD student working on some of these rocks now, um, and they have got uh, osmium isotope ratio um, for a grain from the Samel ophiolite. Um, which is looking quite convincing, but we're still we're still like checking to make sure it's not just a like a statistical accident and that it's robust because you know like um, people have you use this technique to measure osmium isotope ratios, but you do have to be really careful um, that that it's um, meaningful. I guess a really worrying prospect is that um, if you selectively move around 187, if you a really worrying prospect might be that if you could move around 187 osmium in these rocks, you could artificially generate um, relatively old melt depletion ages. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think certainly for this, the whole rock is robust. Um, I'll show you my graphs afterwards if you like. All right, I could. I, uh, we sh can I just put them up now quickly? Oh yeah, bird um for bird people. Um yeah, so I just did some mass balance calculations to see if we are seeing the amount of grains that we'd expect for the size and for the um the first number is the the fraction of platinum group element in the grain, and the second number is the concentration in PPB in the whole rock. So the fact that these all intersect um, suggests that we're not seeing mobilization on the whole rock scale. So if you do whole rock um, and it's a thing like this, but on the grain scale, um, I, I would say that maybe not. So. I will make the, la the last one. Regarding to a couple of things with the image you show with the alloy, the platinum, Copper alloy and the lyrite. Yeah. Okay. 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 First thing, what is inside of the lyrite? There's there is a rounded shape there. Do you know what is inside? Okay. That's that because um, <laughs> if if it's a it's because it, like I, it's it's so tiny that it was very difficult to characterize. Okay. And, and now it's and we were kind of hoping that we might get an interface with it. Um. Uh 
but we didn't and the needles exploded so okay yeah, its identity is lost forever I'm afraid. yeah, yeah. The, the other thing is when you talk about the origin of the copper platinum alloy if i'm wrong probably correct, correct me in the image of the needle i saw platinum and the core and then a rim of iron is i'm right or i'm wrong this, this image? yeah you have iron up at the boundary a platinum so i'm wondering if is this kind of uh, a mixing that you can expect at low temperature yeah so i think i think these subbrains are forming as we slide down this phase diagram but but obviously because it's 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 more than ternary so i i think we're starting to get a mixing on on these um on, on whatever shape these are in six dimensional space okay yeah so we, let's finish yeah so uh, we have um we had the two virtual talks that uh, didn't materialize so i think what we should do is we have an early tea an early coffee um and come back at about um um to um 245 and some people have asked that we should do a photograph a group photograph we could do that quickly outside the uh, door the sun is coming from that side so if we just stand in front of the door to this building here out, if we get out there let's do a group photo five minutes or so and then we have an early tea and then we have a very exciting session still after tea with lots of really um exciting bushfeld talks my passion so please don't abandon us now so i don't know if anybody has a camera a decent camera there we go there we go martin has a good camera yeah. Okay, good. Um, very confused about this session. I, I, I was sharing it and I didn't even realize because I only saw the printed version. So I apologize. Um, 